What does the future of the church look like? Given the challenges that the church is facing in today's culture, we might be wrestling with what sharing our faith or evangelism looks like today. Or perhaps another question would be, what is discipleship and what type of processes should we employ into the local church in order to see more people become just like Jesus? Or perhaps you're curious about what church planting movements will look like in 10, 15, 20 years from today. And maybe if you're like me, you're trying to figure out how best to train up people so that they could be empowered and trained and equipped and released in order to plant churches all over the world, no matter what context God calls them into. Well, I recently had the opportunity to attend the Send Institute's think tank on the future multiplying church. It was hosted by, by the Send Institute, by Daniel Yang and a host of other missiologists. And, and because I'm a vineyard pastor, I had the opportunity to go as a representative of the vineyard movement, along with Michael Gatlin, who is the national coordinator of church planning here in the US. But I figured in this vlog, episode three, you'll be able to see a little bit about what we were wrestling with, what we were hearing, what we were thinking about. And at the end of this video, I'll kind of give a summary of what I took away from my time down in Oakland for the Send Institute's think tank, The Future Multiplying Church. So check it out. Okay, I am here in Oakland, uh, and I don't know why I'm here, other than there's a think tank on church planting. So yeah. So Who yeah. are you? What are we doing? What's this about? Okay, so my name is Tiffany Smith, and I work with the SEND Institute. And we are gathering a group of people who love church planting and who are multipliers and who have a heart and passion um, to reach lostness in North America. And so we um, decided to have a think tank for the future multiplying church. What does that look like? Okay. How can we collaborate together? What are some things we can learn from one another? So it's a fun group because it's cross-denominational and so okay. lots of different people. So there's going to be Baptists. Yep charismatic people yeah. um there's gonna be presbyterians yeah. uh, a little bit of everybody yeah a little bit of everybody okay and uh and it's kind of the who's who of church planning in their I denomination say, i would say so it's a good group of yeah. folks so i would between all the churches and um, if, if you tried to add up the number of churches mm -hmm. they planted to be over a thousand Wow. Oh, and then somehow I was able to sneak in. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They didn't check my credentials. But yeah. um, okay, so you work for Ascend Institute and you, uh, who are the people that you directly are responsible to and you work, work with? with? Yeah. So I work with Jeff Christopherson and Ed Setzer. They're the executive directors and um, they co lead this adventure. And then uh, Daniel Yang is the director and then okay. I work with him um, strategizing and working on the website. So Jeff Christofferson is National Board of Baptist Missions he, or something. What is it? He, he works at the North American Mission Board as a missiologist Okay. Now, but now he's also just focusing in really hard on the Send Institute. And he's written a ton of uh, books on King, uh, Kingdom... Kingdom First, yeah, yeah. Kingdom Matrix. I think he's got another Kingdom yeah. book coming out. So and then, So you said him and who? Ed Stetzer. I feel like I know that name. Yeah. Um, Ed Stetzer. Okay, so Ed Stetzer, the Ed Stetzer of uh, Billy Graham church right. planning right. world. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, and then who else is who else do you work Daniel with? Daniel Yang. Okay, Daniel so Yang. He's the director of it all. Okay. He makes everything. Awesome. Happen. And so it's kind of an interdenominational think tank. It's been uh, built as a think tank. So over the next two days, what are we going to be doing? So we'll do some collaborating and, and some 
just kind of learning from one another. What are you doing? What is God doing in your world? How can we learn from you? And we'll talk about some things that are challenges for us. What are some sticking mm. points? What are some things that we can help one another with? So we can speak into each other a little bit, encourage cool. each other, um, help each other come up with new ideas, and then maybe leave with some action plans. Awesome. Know? So we're kind of collaborating together to learn about how we can do church planning better, more or less. Yeah. Okay. Pretty All much. Right, awesome. What is the future of church planning look like and how can we multiply that out instead of additional church planning church planning by addition how can we be church planning by multiplication awesome okay hey good morning y'all just before we even say another word or meet another person can we just thank grace point for their hospitality uh, Pastor Ed, thank you. Uh, i'm just blown away so people are recognizing that your beard has been shortened. Yeah, it's, you know, there you go. That's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, uh, we're here with the uh, SEND Institute, and this is Jeff, and you are the executive uh, director, correct? Right. All right, and you just shared about uh, four shifts that you see coming. Would you be willing to share that with the audience? Yeah, well, for us, we have to, to get to movement, and to get to movement, we need, in my view, a, a different kind of Jesus, and uh, I know that sounds a bit trite, but but not, not just the Sunday morning Jesus that we're used to, where, and if you're looking at, you know, Ephesians 4, 4, 11, 12, you know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, yeah. shepherd, teacher. Shepherd and teacher fits really nicely in that Sunday morning Jesus. The rest really don't have a room. Yeah, and yeah. so we're saying that Jesus himself was all of those four. And gotcha. so the body of Christ needs to be all of those four as well. And uh, and then we need a different kind of church, a church that doesn't see itself as the goal, but, but sees the kingdom of God as the goal, and it's the vehicle for that goal. Because when the church sees itself as a goal, it becomes idolatrous. It mm. becomes um, weak. I mean, it doesn't have any power like we mm. see in Second Timothy. It's just like, it's absolutely. And so so um, a different kind of church, we need a different kind of a disciple. And okay. uh, and that disciple is is somebody that, that, is, that a, the church is seeing like, all right, I'm taking you from a, a spiritually curious person. I've got a pathway to help you see that your role can be a team member on a church planning to multiply your and so the church doesn't see itself as the dead end link on that Great Commission awesome. chain, but continues to work there. And finally, we need a different kind of planter. And uh, I think gone are the days in the future where we're funding a, you know, a solo planter yeah, yeah. that have to move from one context to another context, don't know that context, and have no, no relationships or credibility in that context. Mm. But instead, we say, okay, actually we're going to raise up co-vocational. That's a distinction from bivocational. It means mm. my vocation is part of me. It's, yeah. a, it's together with who I am. I it's that. a calling and uh, co-vocational teams that might be apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, together looking like the body of Christ and, um, and working out, working that way. And, and then all the money that comes from that church doesn't go to support maintenance of what that's going, but actually go, can go into ministry. So the missional community has $10,000 every year to work with to meet any need that it, yeah. that's in front of them. That's and, awesome. uh, and, the, and the gospel just keeps rolling. Cool, and cool. So, yeah, yeah. That's great. So you yeah. said a uh, bigger Jesus, a uh, bigger church. Uh, a, di sense. a different kind different of church. Kind of church. Yeah. Different uh, kind of disciple. disciple yeah. And then church planner. That's right. Different right. kind of church planner. That's yeah. awesome. All right, Michael, you just, uh, you're an artist. And you just drew some some. Well, it's not that good. <laughs> That's beautiful art. Yeah. Uh, would you do me a favor and explain why? How does this represent the vineyard? Yeah, we're talking about discipleship in our churches, and so what I picture is out of Psalm one, a tree planted by streams of water that, like, the leaf never withers; it bears fruit in season, out of season. It's like a, a well-rounded disciple of Jesus. I, I picture a really healthy tree in my mind, and so in the root structure. Uh, you basically have, we're rooted and grounded in Christ. And I think of it in terms of three big roots, knowing, being, and doing. And, and those roots are actually the different ways that we begin to embody the life of the kingdom, the life of Christ. And then, and then the tree has just tons of fruit. And, uh, and so I picture like generosity, I picture kingdom engagement, I picture disciple making, you know, healthy relationships, like all those different things are the fruits of the spirit. And you could go right to the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5. <laughs> And then I picture a tree is never alone, it's actually reproducing. So the fruit eventually like falls to the ground, there's seeds in all the fruit, and the fruit is reproducing, it becomes an orchard, it becomes a forest. And it's like, that's like the natural life of 
a disciple of Jesus. And and, uh, and and I would think about it in terms of even four stages of discipleship. So there's the there's the seed that gets planted. We're spiritually curious, and it grows into this little seedling, which needs a lot of care and protection. And you have a ton of seedlings that are like, you know, in the forest floor, but a few of them really grow up to become saplings. And, uh, and and then eventually full mature trees. And you have to think about stages of spiritual growth and what keeps us from growing and what makes it hard to grow. I think it all kind of, I don't know, I like it. It's a good image for me. Yeah. All right. So there we go. This is some Michael Gatlin artwork. Uh, I wrote that. <laughs> so there it is. That's the vineyard tree. Hey, I'm with uh, my friend, my new friend, Ron. Uh, and why don't you share where you're from and sure. uh, a little bit of what you're doing. Sure, my name is Ron Tobias. I'm the executive pastor of Spanish River Church in Boca Raton, Florida. Awesome. Well, you, you made a profound statement this morning, I think, um, that's really important about discipleship. Uh, could you just like, restate kind of what you talked about and then maybe flesh that out just for sure, a Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I was sharing about um, <laughs> just how Sunday morning, our, our focus of our, of our churches, most churches are such a big focus on what happens on Sunday morning. Mm. We put tons of resources into it, put tons of effort into it, and um, the reality is it's becoming less and less relevant in our culture today. Mm. There's fewer and fewer people going to church on Sunday morning. And so the, the thought is the fact that we need to look for other ways of discipling people. Uh, we're still called, Matthew. Matthew makes it very clear that's a great commission of what we're supposed to do, and yet uh, yet they're not coming to us, so we need to go mm. to them. And so the thought basically is that we need to make disciples, but they're, since they're not coming, we need to look for other ways of doing that. Uh, and so right. it's not a, not, may not be a necessarily a primary way of making disciples anymore, just through Sunday morning services. Yeah, so it's being sent out uh, Monday yeah. through Saturday and focusing more about evangelism, discipleship happening outside of the church walls, so to speak. Yeah, basically it's going to yeah. them, not waiting for them to come to yeah. us. I think that, that was like a really, really helpful uh, idea. So I appreciate you taking the time well, to do this. Yeah, well, awesome. Yeah. So hey, I am sitting here with vlog, actually we're not sitting, uh, we're standing. Standing, kind of yeah. Awkward. Yeah. Uh, I'm with Rob, who is part of We Are Church. Yeah. And uh, you guys are connected to Francis Chan mm -hmm. and part of his network uh, here in the Bay Area. And so you made a really profound statement about pastoring and what that looks like. So I'd love to have you share, What what is that? Yeah, so for us, pastoring is more than just communicating a great message. It's actually living life with your people. And, you know, Peter, uh, what is it, 5 1, he, he exhorts the elders to, you know, be example to the flock and to shepherd them, not under compulsion, but willingly. So for us, it just means like inviting you into our home, into our lives, not creating a, an extra space to do mm. discipleship, yeah. but actually just saying, hey, come on into my life, live cool. with me. So a lot of times our people are just moving in together. Awesome. So everybody that I co-pastored with, I've lived with. Every single co-pastor, so there's been about three of them now. Oh, that's awesome. So we've spent about a year that's with great. each time. So yeah. it's just life on life discipleship. And you were that. saying that you guys are exponentially growing where you've been, uh, like it's actually, uh, your leadership development is yeah. a challenge right now. What's that look like in uh, San Francisco? Yeah, Exponential so, growth. So from one to two, two to four, four to eight, and then from eight to 13, and then now we're slowing down mm. because developing leaders isn't as fast as multiplication is. Yeah. So it's just about every year we're multiplying or sooner or later, but always a healthy rhythm of multiplication, sending out awesome. and raising up leaders. And that's part of discipleship is just raising up leaders taking care of them you know awesome well there's a lot of people that are huge fans of what you guys are doing so yeah. uh it's awesome so thanks for taking thanks the time man let's know what god's doing so right it's awesome Bless you, man. yeah yeah I'm, I, I have to be the numbers person i don't like numbers but i have to be we plant about we net about 300 churches uh a year in the u.s we plant about 4,000. we close about 3700 in order for us to keep up with population growth for 2050 we need to net around 1800 churches a year in order to keep up with population growth. Every year, we're not planting churches, that increases the burden for the next generation. 
intuitively, I think we know what we need to do. We just we just have to really work on it. Yeah, my name is Brian Fry. I serve as a National Collegiate Strategist at the North American Mission Board. This is like the guy. Uh, uh, I'm part of the team. One of the guys. Uh, what just happened over the course of the last uh, yeah, two days? Yeah, man, it's pretty, pretty crazy. So we have just brought together 13 churches from around North America, and actually some people outside the United States as well, who we know are pioneers, kind of leaders, innovators in the idea of co-vocational church planting. So brought them together for 48 mm -hmm. hours and asked them hard questions about mm -hmm. what they can be and what they are now, and then basically tried to set up a pathway to move from current reality to future reality. Awesome. So we're trying to push push people to go from where they are to go and move mental in their planting. Sweet. And where are you based out of yourself? I live in Columbus, Ohio. Columbus? You're in Columbus. I oh, am. there's a very large vineyard in Columbus. A uh, guy named Rich, you might have heard of a guy named Rich Nathan. I don't Pretty know. Pretty incredible yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, hey, thanks a lot for everything you guys man, have done. So it's been good. Great. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for listening in. And uh, man, just watch what comes out of this uh, this multiplying church thing. I think it's awesome. going to have some implications cool. system wide. Uh, thanks. Right. Thanks so much. <laughs> Hey, before uh, we jump into this next little interview I did, uh, I just wanted to mention that, you know, in 1994, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Toronto, Canada, uh, that became known as the Toronto Blessing. It happened in a small vineyard church, uh, and its impact has literally touched thousands upon thousands of people. Myself and others were deeply impacted by the move of the Holy Spirit, and um, unfortunately, a few years after that had happened, there was a split that happened between the Toronto church and the vineyard. That Toronto vineyard went on to become the Catch the Fire, a movement of churches uh, that are still focused on renewal. And I'm excited because I had the chance at this uh, think tank to sit down with several of their leaders uh, to talk a little bit about church planting, um, what we've learned, and where we're at right now as, uh, as just two different movements. So uh, this is my uh, discussion with them. All right, so I have the pleasure right now of sitting with a few people from Toronto. And uh, so I'm gonna ask them some questions. They're gonna talk a little bit and you'll see why this is unique and important for a Vineyard Voice meeting with Toronto people. Uh, you guys are with Catch the Fire, yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, so tell us a little bit about Catch the Fire and uh, why that is unique for a Vineyard uh, and, and Catch the Fire like talking right now, uh, yes. 20 years later. <laughs> well, of course, uh, you know, with all the um, you call it the manifestations I think was at the core of why there was kind of a split uh, back in back in the day as they would say uh, but but I, I think at the at the at the at the heart of a sort of you know catch the fires Genesis is really uh, vine vineyard theology and outlook on things uh, so uh, very much empowered evangelicals mm. uh, there's more to the world than, yeah. than just you know close to heaven we're on our own um, so we really carry a we really carry deep down, I think, uh, the, the vineyard in our heart. Mm. And um, uh, it's as we were just saying, it's more than just cousins, we really feel yeah. like. Uh, we're brothers know. and sisters Exactly, Christ, right? exactly, <laughs> exactly. But yeah. more, we have we have an affinity. Yeah. yeah so so uh, really quickly, for those of you uh, out there, uh, why don't you introduce yourselves, because you are you run church planning within uh, Catch the Fire. And so uh, I think that's really fascinating that Catch the Fire now, 20 years later, is doing church planning. Actually, you've been doing church planning longer than oh, just yeah. 20 years. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah. And you had 35 churches? Yeah. Is that? Okay. Yeah. So introduce yourselves. Like, tell us a little bit about your story. Because sure. I know you pastored for a while. That's right. And yeah. then you said you were an accountant for... Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. No. no, but, well, the but, uh, but Catch the months, Fire, when, we, months, when yeah. we came to... Because uh, uh, all my trainings in uh, theology and pastoring. So okay. When we came to... Uh, to catch fire was uh, Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship. Then uh, they didn't know us very well, so they were kind of like, "Well, let's see if we like you or and you like us." So they put me in an accounting role, which was just ridiculous. But <laughs> but uh, but we got to know each other well, and and that seemed to seemed to be good. So I'm I'm Gordon, as you said, and uh, I'm one of the directors of the School of Ministry in Toronto. And I'm Kathy Harris, and I'm the other director of the school ministry. And yeah, I would agree. I mean, Vineyard, we wouldn't be where we are if it weren't for yeah. the Vineyard Church. So Vineyard Church, thank you very much. Yeah. Mm. You know, you guys changed uh, oh, worship. worship. We, we, we had never experienced worship before. We had a friend that started sending us Vineyard CDs, and literally we would just hit the floor and, and way before we were in the Toronto Church. Yeah. And just the Lord ministered to us and, and really changed our theology. So. I want to say thank yeah, you for that. You've made a massive yeah, impact. Yeah. And um, here we are in Toronto, um, having an amazing time. I would say, again, because of John Wimber, 
Uh, church planting has always been at the core of who we are. It's taken us a while to get there, to be yep. uh, really actively doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and now we are on a mission. We're like, this is the time. God is calling us to not just be a gathering church, but be a scattering church and be all over the world. And so um, we're going for it. We uh, are making a few blunders along the way, but um, Less than having, we used to. having some great successes and super passionate that our church planters are well in their heart and they're on fire for God and their their families are intact and that and that we're multiplying um, everywhere we go. Awesome. And so you have you have somebody with you right now. Yes. Right. And this is just as an introduction. This is um, Robin Lambert. She's married to Daniel uh, Lambert and Robin came to our school of ministry uh, 2001. 2000. Uh, no, 2003. 2003, yeah. and so wow. she's kind of the, you know, a, a beautiful product of what we dream of in the school ministry, that she came to the school, she got rooted and grounded in the love of the Father and in, and in, and in the Bible, and now has gone out with her husband and planted Catch Fire Sydney. Mm -hmm. So do this, do a favor, do me a favor. Will you share a little bit about like uh, what what does that look like in Sydney? Because uh, you have an awesome accent uh, for those <laughs> of us watching this video. Uh, you don't think you have one? We do. But uh, tell us what's what's God doing in Sydney and how's that church plant happening and what's it what's it uh, what's it look like right now? Uh, it's been super exciting. So we basically started six years ago and we had um, so Daniel and I were living in Singapore at the time and we got asked. They said we'd love to have a catch the fire in Sydney. Would you guys do it? And the Lord just spoke to us about like, yes, that's the place to go. And um, it's been so exciting. We basically went in knowing nobody in a city and mm. said, what does it look like to plant a church here? And we just started asking the Lord to bring people to us. And we found all these people who had similar hearts and just wanted to get on board. And our team kind of developed on the ground, mm. which was amazing. Um, and so Dan's been working, uh, you know, he worked full-time jobs. So we've been kind of been doing this in our spare time. So we've had, uh, <laughs> in our spare time, we've now got yeah, a great- It's a hobby. Yeah. It's been a hobby, yeah, yeah. very yeah. passionate yeah. hobby. Yeah. And uh, it's been super exciting. So we've got a church uh, that's um, you know, a couple hundred people and we're um, right. just really enjoying meeting up and being church together. And there's been cool healings. I think that's been really fun. We've yeah. seen lots of people get healed, um, especially so we started doing missions trips overseas. And we just saw like, that was so exciting. People go on this team and they just see, come back and be like, blind people are seeing mm. and like lame people are walking and yeah, just yeah. really fun stories. So um, we've loved that. And then out of the missions trips, we ended up having two churches that kind of started spontaneously out of the missions trips because people, you know, just uh, got on fire for God over in the missions countries and they started gathering and we started this like long distance connect group. Um, and then they've become churches um, in and of themselves. So we call them, they're our campuses, they're just yeah. a long way away. So and you're having you're having multiplication, disciple making disciples, making disciples. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So we're starting doing another campus now within Sydney because we've got Sydney's a really big city. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, so we, we've basically driven half an hour on the freeway out, and uh, we've wow. started another one out there because oh, they just can't awesome. get to us otherwise. And that's awesome. It's so cool, yeah, and people are getting really healed there. So and that, God's that's presence. the fruit of Catch the Fire. Uh, Twenty cool. years later, 20 years which later. you know in the vineyard we we've heard all these stories. Well, there's so many. I mean Heidi Baker, yeah. there's so many people that have been impacted. Oh, yeah, I have Johnson. Yeah, yeah I, I was impacted. There, yeah. I have so many friends that were like their lives yeah. were changed, yeah. you know, in yeah. Toronto, yeah. and so it's really cool to think yeah. about 20 years later. So yeah. here, I want to I want to ask this question. Uh, so here's kind of the question I'm I'm asking here uh, is, in, in your opinion, um, like what you had mentioned, you can that you got worship from the vineyard, so that's yeah. something you can appreciate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what would you say is something you can learn from the vineyard right now, and then what do you think that the vineyard can learn from from you guys? Like what's you know. Like what's the way we can cross pollinate right, to sure. use that old yeah, uh, that sure. old language? Yeah. So yeah. what would you guys think about that? Yeah. Well, I think just in terms of legacy, there's so many things that came out of the vineyard and out of uh, John Wimber uh, that you know it does it, it's not you know it happens so very often that we're saying you remember John Wimber Always. said this. Yeah. Somebody came to me, a, a well-known person said, "Tell me about your healing model." Mm. So I said, "Well." Honestly, it goes back to John Wimber, yeah. and here's how five-step prayer that's model. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, that's how I do that. So uh, there's still a lasting legacy uh, that that undergirds yeah. us, even for people who don't understand mm. where it came from. Um, I think, uh, I think, and I understand the vineyard is quite wide, but there is a there there is a kind of um, vulnerability. Let's just be regular people, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, and in this climate, especially when. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, people are looking for authenticity mm. instead of performance, that, that's a big deal. Yeah. And uh, I think we yeah. have some of that, but cool. we, uh, we, can, we need to continue to come back and keep touch base with that, yeah. Um, yeah. that, that part of what Vineyard yeah. is about. Cool. And that's always like, it seems like that's kind of the challenge, right? With, uh, with the charismatic yeah. yes, aspect that's of things, right. like, right? Cause you don't want to stifle the work of the spirit, but yeah. at the same time too, like, uh, trying to, uh, keep it in a way that, uh, I don't know, is accessible to people yeah. or maybe doesn't Genuine. totally weird them out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. The authenticity yeah. thing. So that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah. your, uh, that's how you think, um, the vineyard could impact yeah. you. Is there anything you would add yeah. to that? Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I think how we could, I don't know vineyard. I haven't yeah. been in a vineyard church in a long well, time. Tell us what so we need. I know. Yeah. I would say what you need is maybe what, what did you lose at that time mm. of the separation? Yeah. And I don't know what that is, yeah. but I think it'd be a great question to ask. Did yeah. we, did we, we lost lose? access to Tim Hortons. That's well, a, yeah, <laughs> that's a big one. I know, I know. That's very good. Do you know no, there's what, vineyards in Canada. Yeah. 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 Do you know, I read, I read John Wimber's books in probably like 1998. And I yeah. remember going back to the copyright and see it had been written mm. in like 1987 or something yeah. i was so gypped i'm just like where have i been for 10 yeah, years yeah. and i didn't even know you could <laughs> pray for healing or that so, there yeah. was such thing as like supernatural evangelism yeah. and you know his story was it was so real yeah you know and it just was gripping so that's what i would say i would say that would be the question i would ask the vineyard did you lose something not yeah. in a criticism but that, that you yeah. need to take back because it's actually love. part of your inheritance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. You know, and, mm. and even the way God works and speaks and, yeah. and did we lose something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's good. I think we're, yeah. we're all diminished in a way mm. by that. Um, yeah. But it's really encouraging to, to see all over the globe, it's undoing it. That the whatever wreckage was there yeah. is undoing it itself. Is. Yeah, yeah, it is. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's, it, it is amazing how like uh, water under the bridge, time, yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah, like, yeah. Like, what, and perspective. What's that again? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, one, one, um, one cool thing on that was yeah. so when we when we were planning in Sydney, so there's no other catch the fire churches in Australia at the time. Yeah. And um, we found that our closest, like, when we looked around the churches in Sydney and we said, who could we learn off and who's here? Yeah. The vineyard church there was the closest to mm. us yeah. in terms yeah, of yeah. who are we? Yeah. Yeah. And they've just been the best help to us and the nicest awesome. friends. Yeah. And nice. they so supported us. Like, we yeah. still, we reach out to them. Nice. They pray for us. We pray for them. Yeah. And yeah, that yeah. friendship, it's been so helpful for us. Uh, that's so awesome. I love it. That's cool. really yeah. nice. Uh, okay, so uh, one last question I have for you uh, is, uh, by the way, this vlogging thing is so weird. I at least just uh, like, hey, you're, no, you're not there, but uh, <laughs> it's so weird. Uh, I'd love to ask you the question of, um, you know, what does uh, empowering women look like in the Catch the Fire, uh, you know, I guess stream of the church, you know, because you, you have a lot of women uh, pastors, you're, you're empowering them. So tell me about what that looks like in your experience. Yeah. You want to go first? Uh, wow. Well, um, certainly in the school, you know, we have a, uh, we have, uh, you know, we have our, obviously our students, but then we have our small group leaders and pastoral leaders, and so we we need men and women in all of those roles. Uh, we tend to send them out on teams sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, usually, a guy and a girl uh, leader together. Uh, you know, sometimes the girls are stronger leaders mm -hmm. than the guys, uh, which is fabulous. I think in terms of the church. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always been a it's always been a value, men and women mm. together. Uh, so you know, there's some shifts that have to take place because, uh, as that uh, you know, as traditional roles in some ways take a, a back seat. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, what happens when the woman is speaking on stage? Yeah. Well, who's looking after the well? The husband's gonna have to, yeah. even though he might be a pastor too. You yeah, know, so yeah. there, there there's some working out has to do, but we we really value really value that. And I think um, uh, you know, for me. Uh, I I think there's no there's no big deal, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, I think because women hadn't haven't traditionally had that role, it's harder for them inside to to take that. It's a bit more of a push for them to do that, and I think as a man, we I don't understand that. I yeah. mean, I'm surprised sometimes. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. you know, a woman says, "I oh, take well, things for granted." Yeah, I just yeah. think, well, you you can do that. So it's no problem. What, what yeah. do you mean? You know? Yeah, and, yeah. and I would say that um, that I wasn't converted until I was in university, yeah. and so I had no grid for any of this at all. And I, the church I got into, that we we got into, yeah. and were pastors of, women could not do anything. Mm. I didn't know any different because yeah. I didn't know anything about church, and so it didn't bother me. I was like, I can minister in a thousand different ways so yeah. it's not the thing that I'm fighting for um, so actually coming in to catch the fire 
was a bit of a uh, loyalty clash. I'd been mm. raised, sort of raised, in the last few years church in raised, this yeah. church yeah. raised in this tradition that you can't do that. And I remember the first time I was asked to speak on stage, and I all night I dreamt about I was in court, I was signing divorce papers. I was so it was actually like a very mm. deep thing yeah. that I was breaking my loyalty to wow. a tradition that was true. And um, so it was it was tough, but we, it is all husband and wives, John and Carol are always supporting, yeah. always mm -hmm. pushing out. And mm -hmm. I think yeah. I personally never want to be a woman that's demanding it or a woman that's shrinking away from it. Mm. So it's just trying to live that, yeah. that godly middle of the road. Um, mm. I'm a woman. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, she's, yeah. She's actually uh, at the, she's not, it hasn't always been this way, but at the moment she's, she's the only, uh, female director mm. out of let's say what are there eight of us or something that get together every week so, um, yeah. so only that's... female that graduated from a that old denominational yeah. bible school it, as we, a girl we have that in common by the way my Dude. my yeah. Uh, yeah so non-musical instrument yeah okay, okay yeah, yeah totally yeah, yeah that's what okay. I, my mom yeah. became a christian in that wow. so really yeah. so i can value that yeah. tradition yes. in yes. that regard yes. but yeah yeah uh, yeah know. and so for you it's normal yeah, it's still a stretch sometimes. Yeah. We, um, but it's what we've kind of grown up with now, I guess, in Catch the Fire. So yeah. we love it. I love it that it's always, you know, the guy and the girl. And there's even room for like single girls. Like it's not even that it has to be yeah. once you're married and then it's a guy and a girl going yeah. forwards. It's that what's your calling? What has God put in you to do? Mm. And then how do we do that really well and really safely? And, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that kind of language around, if you've got that calling inside of you, it's going to get trained and developed. And um, yeah, it needs to get done a bit differently sometimes. So like when I was doing stuff as a single female, like before I got married, um, you know, Kathy and Gordon would be helping me out with, okay, well, if, you, if there's a guy who needs ministering to and you're running the group, how are you going to do that? You know, and it's like, we'll get another guy to come along and the guy can do this yeah. part and activate the body yeah. to fulfill the roles because you don't have to do it all. No. So yeah. just um, kind of owning your calling yeah. and owning your gender and owning yeah. who you are mm. uh, and letting God use that. I love it. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Well, so hey, I hope you enjoyed kind of a summary and maybe a little walkthrough of what uh, last week looked like uh, at the Send Institute's think tank on multiplying uh, future churches. Uh, I got a little note, couple notes here on what uh, stood out to me. Um, you know, that I thought maybe, uh, I don't know, might be interesting to some of you. You know, the thing that kind of uh, was really obvious was that church planning, evangelism, discipleship, leadership development, all the things that we're trying to do, I think, in, uh, in our churches is going to require uh, a fair amount of flexibility and adaptability in the future, um, you know, for us to be able to continue God's mission, to partner with the work of the Spirit, uh, and to plant churches in communities that are increasingly post-Christian, uh, or just de-churched or unchurched, whatever you want to call that uh, context. Um, which, by the way, reminds me of a great book by Todd Bolsinger that you should definitely get. There's a link in the description. I'll put one in the bottom uh, called Canoeing the Mountains. I would highly recommend that book if you're interested in uh, figuring out like what adaptability and uh, flexibility looks like and um, just in organizational structures within the church uh, that are organized around the mission rather than the mission organized around the structure. Uh, another thing that really stood out to me was that uh, the focus of the of the think tank was actually on the concept of co-vocational church planting, which is, uh, I think they were trying to really cast vision for it being different than the way that we typically think about bivocational church planting. Um, you know, within my tradition and the tradition I've, traditions I've, I guess I've had connection with over the years, oftentimes bivocational church planting is like, well, I'm going to work this job um, as long as I have to and eventually hopefully the church will get large enough to where I can like become a real pastor and be a real, a real person in ministry. Um, and it's kind of like looked at the, the job as a stepping stone um, and the co-vocational uh, thinking that they were talking about would be to uh, basically more be more holistic and, and integrated in the way that 
one would plant the church, whereas vocation, one's vocation would actually be part of the ministry, part of what one does as a church planner. Uh, and they had a bunch of different reasons why it would be helpful, um, you know, financial freedom. Also, it obviously puts you, it could put you in connection with people uh, in the vocation that you're in. Um, you know, and a lot of it just depends on how people are defining bivocational. I have a good friend named Mac who pastors a church in Valparaiso, Indiana, who is a bivocational pastor. Uh, and he's done that uh, and he, for many of the same reasons that people are doing it in the co-vocational movement. Um, and so, you know, I, I would say it kind of depends on how people are defining finding that word bivocational but uh but that was uh, definitely something that stood out to me um i really liked the idea though uh about you know really having an integrated approach to one's uh life and i think that's good in general but thinking about that in the context of planting churches where you know perhaps your your uh, vocational job is to teach in a school or you know to work at a coffee shop or any of the things that you've traditionally seen uh but that ties into your uh, disciple making your discipleship processes your evangelism uh your, your church planning so to speak so i thought that was really cool um you know i was also really impacted by how many people came up to me and shared stories about how the vineyard or John Wimber impacted them. Um, you know, you kind of get that that sense when you're listening to um, Catch the Fire when those folks were talking about the impact of the vineyard. And so that was really encouraging. Um, and, you know, in many ways, I think when a vineyard church is functioning in a healthy way and we're kind of like living out our theology and our practices, we are perfectly suited to plant churches, to multiply, uh, to make disciples in today's world. And so I think that is a uh, an encouraging uh, thing, but it's also a challenge for us to continue to do all that we can to be healthy vineyard churches. Uh, so that, that stood out to me. Um, and then finally, I got to tell you, uh, the church we were at, Grace Point Church uh, in the Bay Area, uh, in, I think their headquarters is in Oakland. Uh, I was blown away by that church. I mean, just spending time there with some of their leaders was really inspiring. Uh, in fact, you know, what I, what I kind of took away is that their commitment uh, to their mission, which is to plant Acts 2 churches on every college campus, uh, it was so clear that that is what their church is about. Their church is about their mission. And so there was a lot of unity, uh, a lot of community um, stuff was happening around that commitment. Uh, I love the way that they strategize and the way that they are training up leaders and they're, and they're doing it. I mean, 30 years in and they have planted a lot of churches uh, as a just a local church. And uh, it was really cool to see that. I really appreciated uh, the uh, conversations I had with um, their senior pastor, I think Ed Kang. Uh, and then I met a young man, um, actually he's the same age as me, so I guess that I'm hopefully young, uh, but Kevin Ho, uh, one of their uh, leaders also, just really uh, inspiring people to talk talk to you, so uh, shout out to you. Uh, but anyway, overall the Think Tank experience was super fascinating. I took away a lot of things to think about in my own local church context, as well as uh, in just the vineyard movement in general, uh, and then things that I think would help anybody who's wanting to multiply uh, and, and spread the message of Jesus and the kingdom to as many people as they can. So anyway, that is the vlog. Sorry it's a little long this time, uh, but there was a lot to share with you. So.